It is now time for oral questions. The member from Nipissing. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, last night on TV, you apparently apologized for the gas plant scandal. My question is, what did you apologize for? Are you sorry for not listening to the residents of Mississauga and Oakville? Are you sorry for building power plants in residential neighbourhoods? Are you sorry for paying companies not to build power plants? Are you sorry for buying five Liberal seats with $585 million? Are you sorry for destroying documents and keeping the truth from Ontarians? Or are you just sorry you got caught? Minister of Energy, come to order. Minister of Durham, come to order. The member from Durham will withdraw. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And I, uh, I would have thought that there might have been a bit of a preamble to that question, Mr. Speaker, that would have said something like, you know, you did the right thing, Premier. We've been asking for an apology, and, and you apologize. I would have thought that that might have been what he said. However, however, Mr. Speaker, that is not what the member opposite said, and so I will just I will just say what I said last night, Mr. Speaker. I. I believe, from here on, Bruce, come to order. I believe that it was important for me, as the Premier in this chair now, to say that uh, I apologize and I'm sorry for the process as it unfolded, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry that Answer. the decision was made in the first place to locate those plants where, where they were located, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sorry it cost so much to undo Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Premier, I'll give you a little uh, history. The Liberals failed to win a majority, which would have covered your tracks. There would have been no scandal hearings. When we tried to get to the truth, the Liberals... Remember, the Minister of Energy come to order. The next time it is, you'll be quicker. Thank you. The Liberals prorogued this House, then redacted, deleted, and destroyed documents that would have gotten us to that truth. That is now your political advisers have all told you that every one of those delay strategies have failed. So the next move is to concoct a political apology. You're sorry you got caught. Premier, Ontarians want more than a hollow apology. They want a refund. Will you order the Liberal Party to pay the money back? Attorney General, come to order. Attorney General, come to order. Minister of Community and Social Services, come to order. The member from Bruce Green Owen Sound, come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I really believe that my primary political relationship is with the people of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, I was speaking to the people of Ontario yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and since I have been in this role, I have been as open and as transparent as I could possibly be, Mr. Speaker. I answered questions at committee. I, have, I made sure that we opened up the process so that all the questions could be asked, so that all the documents that were asked for could be provided, Mr. Speaker. That has happened. We have heard many perspectives at the committee, Mr. Speaker, and I believe that it was important for me to take that personal responsibility, and I have done that. Member from Renfrew, Mr. Speaker, come to order. I really believe that the committee can continue to ask questions and continue to do its uh, to do its due diligence, Mr. Speaker. But I have taken responsibility now to put in place a process that Sir? will ensure that this will not happen That's again. Right. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, it would have been a lot better for Ontarians if you did something about this scandal back in 2011 when you first saw the documents in Cabinet. 
You knew this was a bad deal back then, and you, you could have stopped this from ever happening. But your late apology comes with consequences. If you're really sincere, you'd arrange for the Liberal Party to pay back the money. If you're really sorry, you'd order your Liberal witnesses to return to the committee and tell the truth this time, and you would stand here and answer the pivotal question in this scandal. When did you know the costs were more than you publicly stated? If you're not prepared to, Premier, then call our confidence motion and let this House decide if your apology was sincere. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, well, I'm glad that the member opposite. Uh, Excuse me. The member from Cambridge will come to order. Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm glad the member opposite uh, mentioned confidence, Mr. Speaker, because it really is important now, I believe, that we have this discussion about the budget, because the budget is the, it is the confidence issue that is before this House, Mr. Speaker, that, has a, that will have a direct impact on the lives of people in Ontario. I have, uh, I have visited a couple of manufacturing companies in the last couple of days, Mr. Speaker, and they are very happy about the measures that we have in the budget that will support their purchase of new equipment yep. and new technology and will support young people getting the training, the skills training that they need in order to be able to work in their businesses. That's the kind of measurement, Answer. Mr. Speaker, that needs to be in place. That's why we need the budget to pass. So I look forward to uh, a debate on the budget and getting the budget passed, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from the Carleton. Sure, Mr. Speaker. My question is as well to the Premier. For a number of months in this House and in the committee room, we asked you to apologize to the people of Ontario. And only last night, when you decided to seek ab absolution from a taxpayer funded journalist, did you offer that? Did your apology for the Liberal seat saving plan? that cost Ontario families hundreds of millions of dollars for thwarting democracy includes saying sorry for co-chairing the Liberal campaign team that made the crass political decision to cost taxpayer dollars? Did it include you signing a memorandum to Cabinet that you either did not understand or chose to withhold from the public? Are you sorry for not telling Ontarians that you knew the true cost Question. were higher than $40 million? Are you sorry that you were hiding from calling the PC? confidence motion, or was your Steve Pake and climb down a pop, pop PR stunt? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I, uh, I've answered a lot of the, uh, the issues that the member opposite raised. I went to committee. I answered all the questions that were asked of me, Mr. Speaker. And you know, again, the member opposite is one of the, her voice is one of the voices that has been calling for uh, a taking of personal responsibility. And, and I did that last night, Mr. Speaker. I made it clear that I take personal responsibility. That I'm sorry about the mistakes that our government made, Mr. Speaker. And we have said we have said that there were mistakes made. We have said that the process was not what it should have been and that those gas plants should not have been located where they were in the first place. We need a process going forward that will make sure that doesn't happen again, Mr. Speaker, and that is what I apologized for last night. This has been an interesting PR exercise, but, Speaker, you are well aware that my colleagues and I have asked 130 times what this Premier knew when she knew it, when that cost ballooned well past $40 million, and she has refused over 130 times to offer that. So excuse us on this side of the House for expecting your staged apology last night with a taxpayer-funded journalist to be nothing more than a PR stunt. Now, Speaker, we on this side of the House suspect that that Premier refused this. Order. Finish, please. I think I touched a nerve, Speaker, but I suspect she refuses to acknowledge what she knew and when she knew it because she will be held in contempt of Parliament if she is. Isn't it true, Premier, that your Minister of Training College and Universities come to order? Attention away from this scandal. And, Speaker, and Premier, if you were truly Thank you. sorry for scamming Ontarians Thank out of you. hundreds of millions of dollars, would you Thank you. Seated, please. And uh, 
while the clock is stopped, I would remind this member and all members, when I stand, you sit. And if you don't look at me, that's not my responsibility. The member, come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I just want to make a commentary on the political environment that we operate in because I think it is, you know, I understand why the uh, the member opposite would talk about uh, PR, but I honestly believe that the the frame that she is putting around what I said last night says more about her than it does about me, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Absolutely. It actually does. Because, you know, I'm a human being doing this job, and I have. I have to do this job in the best way that I can. That's right. And I have I have done everything I could, Mr. Speaker, to open up this process. I continue to get calls from people of Ontario who said, you know, we want to see that personal responsibility taken. That's what I did last night, Mr. Speaker. It had nothing to do with public relations. Yes, it had nothing to do with a political stunt. It had to do with me member taking Prince personal Edward responsibility. And whether the members opposite believe that or not is really immaterial, Mr. Speaker. Answer. I did what I knew I I needed to do. Final supplementary. Of course she knew what she needed to do. She needed to say she was sorry to the public because her pre-R stunt is, is the only thing that's going to move her past this and divert attention from the matter at hand, which is she's come to this House repeatedly and said that this cost $40 million when she knew for a very long period of time it wasn't. She came to committee, evaded 11 questions from me at that moment and another 29 from my colleague from, from uh, Nipissing. I will say this, Speaker. This is a minister. This is a premier who has spent hundreds Hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money in order to save Liberal MPP seats. She decided to go to a taxpayer-funded uh, journalist last night with a script to stage a PR campaign so she could distract the public from telling the truth. If she's saying sorry really means what she did was wrong, she would know that she needs to call the Ontario PC contempt motion to the floor of this House, not only for debate, but for a vote, and Thank for you. the Speaker that she should bring a judicial Thank you. Fire. You see it, please? You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier? Well, really I think job. we should come to the defense of Steve Paykin yeah, over yeah. here, actually, and, and uh, TV Ontario. I think, I think TV Ontario is a terrific, terrific institution, Mr. Speaker. But quite apart from that, let me just talk about the confidence motion. Mr. Speaker, let me just talk about the confidence motion that is before us, because clearly the members opposite want to have the opportunity to vote on a confidence motion. The budget is the confidence Mayor motion, Mr. Speaker, that I believe is extremely relevant to the lives of people in Ontario. There are measures in the budget, Mr. Speaker, that will create jobs in this province and that will deal with issues that will affect people in their day-to-day -day lives. I look forward to that debate, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to seeing that budget pass, because I believe that we need to get on with Answer. the business of that, just what I said, creating jobs and making changes that will affect people's day-to-day -day jobs. That's what our day-to-day -day lives, that's what our confidence motion is Thank about. You. Question. Here the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As the Premier knows, we'll be sitting down this afternoon, and I've been clear with the public that this is a uh, for two parties to tone it down. 
I'm not asking for extra comments. Leader. Thanks, Speaker Wunchy. That was an unexpected bit of excitement there for a minute. Uh, nonetheless, I've been clear with the public that uh, it's going to be an open and transparent process that, that we engage in. So I'm going to ask this question in public, Speaker. Is the pre uh, Premier ready to move forward with me measures that are going to make this uh, uh, government more transparent and more accountable? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we will have a good conversation this afternoon. Terms, terms of endearment take different forms. <laughs> Speaker, I look forward. I look forward to sitting down with the leader of the third party and uh, having a conversation about the suggestions that she has made. And I will. I will just say, Mr. Speaker, I'm not. I'm not going to comment on the specifics because that's why I think we need to have a face-to-face -face meeting. But, Mr. Speaker, I believe that finding ways for government to be more accountable and making sure that we do everything we can to be accountable, that absolutely is uh, is what I would like to uh, like to talk with the uh, the leader of the third party about, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, Speaker, because Ontarians are the people who actually want to be hopeful in this process. They want to see real change that makes the government more transparent and more accountable to them, Speaker. After all, the government is here for them, not the other way around. Yesterday, the Premier finally apologized for the gas plant scandal, but it is a day late and a buck short. The money has already been wasted, and the scandal has already happened, and now we need to make sure that it never happens again, Speaker. I hope we all agree in this chamber that Ontarians deserve better. Will the Premier agree that her government needs to be more accountable and transparent, and New Democrats are pro pro proposing effective ways of doing just that? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I look forward to that uh, meeting that we're going to have this afternoon. And I think that accountability is an evolving, um, it's an evolving reality. And, and we have, we have, in fact, as a government, put in a number of accountability measures, Mr. Speaker, that that I think were necessary. So in 2010, the Broader Public Sector Accountability Act that put new rules and uh, higher standards in place in terms of lobbyists, Mr. Speaker, we put those, uh, we put those rules in place. When we were uh, newly elected, Mr. Speaker, in 2004, the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act put in place a, a framework for the conduct of uh, fiscal policy. So we have put those measures in place, Mr. Speaker. But there is always more that a government can do to explore where accountability uh, gaps exist. And you know, I know that, that will be part of our conversation this afternoon. Thank you, Final Supplementary. Speaker. Families want to have confidence in the future. They don't want to be waiting for the next scandal and then waiting for the next apology. I, a financial accountability office will give families assurance that their money won't be wasted. Ontarians want to see transparency and accountability. Will the Premier agree that creating a financial accountability office is actually the right thing to do? So, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the leader of the third party, let's talk about that this afternoon. Let's talk about what some of the specifics of her suggestions are so that I can understand better where she's coming from and whether the suggestions are prudent, whether that they can actually be implemented. Mr. Speaker, we need to have that we need to have that face-to-face -face meeting. I'm glad we're finally able to have it, Mr. Speaker, because I do believe that people want to see they want to see government working. They want to see the parties in this legislature working together. I have heard that over and over and over again, that uh, people want to, want to see us realize and understand that we're in a minority parliament and that it is our responsibility to work together. So I appreciate the willingness of the uh, leader of the third party to now sit down and have this conversation. Thank you. New question. Thank you, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. Uh, Ontarians have told us over the last, last week or so that they wanted to see fairness, balance and transparency. They want to have faith in a health care system, uh, making sure that it will be there for them when they need it and for their loved ones as well. But they've seen a system instead that's rocked by scandals and waste speaker and haven't had anyone to turn to in that process. They want to know that someone will always be in their corner, someone who's independent and who will stick up for them, someone exactly like the Ombudsman Speaker. Will the Premier make the health care system more accountable and allow the Ombudsman to have oversight in our health care system? Again, Mr. Speaker, 
I look forward to having that conversation this afternoon with the leader of the third party because it is one of the suggestions that she has made. But I would just say, Mr. Speaker, that there are a number of accountability mechanisms that already exist within government. And one of the pieces that one of the things I'd like to talk with the leader of the third party about is how we might be able to um, tighten up or improve those accountability mechanisms that already exist because they're there. And I think that we need to we need to come to some kind of agreement on whether they can be improved or not. That's that's one of the things that I would like to put on the table as we have our conversation this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, because I do believe, as I said earlier, there is always room for improvement. So let's look at what's already there. Let's see if uh, if those things can be improved. Because I, like the leader of the third party, believe that accountability is an expectation of yes, the sir. people of Ontario, and we need to do everything we can to be accountable for our actions. Yes. Supplementary. Speaker, I have three things to say to the Premier's uh, comments about accountability of the Liberal government thus far in Ontario. E-Health, Orange and the gas plant scandal. Speaker. People are tired of that. Ontarians told us for the last week and a bit that they are tired of not being able to trust that their government's going to use their money wisely and prudently and for their needs instead of the government's needs or the Liberal Party's needs. They told us they want to see some fairness in this budget as well. They see a government handing a brand new $1.3 billion tax loophole to corporations, while Ontarians are told that they're going to have to belly up $300 million uh, on a bill to start tolling our carpool lanes. Does the Premier think that that that's a fair solution to fund transit and transportation uh, infrastructure. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the leader of the third party knows that uh, the Minister of Finance is in communication with the Federal Minister of Finance on the, uh, the issue around the, uh, the corporate tax regime, and we, we understand that you know that needs to be that's something that we need to work on. But we have to work on it with the federal government, Mr. Speaker. So that's one of the that's one of the things that I want to talk to the leader of the third party about. What is doable? What exactly is doable in terms of the provincial government's jurisdiction and the possibilities? that we have to make changes because I can't make a commitment, Mr. Speaker, either in public or in private, to do something that we don't have jurisdiction over. What we commit to has to be doable and it has to be prudent, which is why, Mr. Speaker, in our budget, we have tackled some of the issues that she raised in terms of uh, auto insurance and the uh, home care accountability, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, tackled those things in a way that's prudent and that we can actually deliver on. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, I hope there are some negotiations happening with the federal government, Speaker, because uh, it wasn't in the budget to get rid of that $1.3 billion upcoming corporate tax loophole. It, it, there was a last-minute letter, letter that was sent by the finance minister to the federal finance minister. That's not good enough for Ontarians, Speaker. It doesn't show a real commitment. New Democrats ask Ontarian, Ontarians what they thought of the budget, and what they told us is that it can stand to be improved particularly on accountability measures, Speaker. They're tired of broken promises. They're tired of wasted money. Is the Premier going to listen to Ontarians and add much-needed accountability and transparency to this budget? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and as I look forward to our conversation this afternoon. And, and Mr. Speaker, I have, uh, I have been listening to the people of Ontario and will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, because I really believe that is how good policy gets made. I think it's very important that politicians, all of us, listen to the people in our ridings, listen to the people across the province about their concerns. And that's what our budget reflects, Mr. Speaker. There's been a lot of talk about where the ideas for the budget came from. They came from, Mr. Speaker, the concerns of the people of the province. And those concerns are about jobs, making sure that, that people's children have jobs and that people themselves can find their way into the economy, Mr. Speaker. And those concerns about their every day lives, making sure that the issues that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis, like the provision of health care for their parents and their grandparents, for our parents and grandparents, making sure that people get the home care, the health care that they need in a timely way. Those are the things that people talk to us about, Mr. Speaker, and there was common ground with the third party, and there was common yes, ground, sir. I believe, with the, uh, the official opposition. That's why I hope we can get this budget passed and we can start to implement those measures, thank you. Mr. Speaker. Question? The member from Durham. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, the gas plant fiasco is the biggest scandal in Ontario's history. Now, Premier, you've tried the denial game, you've tried the cover-up game, you've tried the blame game, and now you.
Put your question, please. Yes, uh, Premier, you've tried the blame game, you've tried the cover up game, you've tried the apology game. And I'm asking you to show some integrity and do the honourable thing. Excuse me. Uh, there, there was a word used there that is unparliamentary, and I ask you to withdraw. Withdraw that uh, single word. Yes, uh, I ask you to do the honourable thing. Look straight in the camera, Premier, and tell the people of, Onta uh, of Ontario either yes, the scandal deserves a vote to you to hold a confidence vote in this House, or no, I refuse to let the people of Ontario hold the Liberal government accountable. Premier, please tell the people of Ontario it's a very simple question. question. Yes or no? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I want to assure the member, and indeed assure all members of this House, I can guarantee it, Mr. Speaker. In the next several weeks, there will be a confidence motion in this House. We will be bringing forward the budget motion, which is a matter of confidence, and members will have a chance to both debate and vote on it. But, Mr. Speaker, to the first part of the honourable member's question, I go back to uh, some of the comments I made yesterday. Could he explain to us why, when the Liberal government, when the Liberal Party decided in the last election to promise the cancellation of the gas plants. According to them, it was the worst thing to have ever befallen the Western civilization. But, Mr. Speaker, when the Leader of the Opposition made the exact same promise, it was somehow okay. And why, Mr. Speaker, when the Leader of the Opposition appeared in front of committee yesterday, he would not even deign to explain the difference between the two positions. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, sir, back to the Premier. Premier, in your speech from the throne, you talked about, and I quote, your government and your cabinet ministers will be accountable to the people of Ontario. It boggles my mind, Speaker, that any member of this House could prop up this scandal-plagued government in, such good, in good conscience. Premier, once again, I ask you, will you call on this Assembly to debate our want of confidence motion so that once and for all we can deal with this issue? Truly and truly restore accountability in Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Do you do that, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, let, you, you want to talk about accountability? Please Let's review the right facts. Right. The new premier came into office. One of her first actions was to ask the Auditor General to look into the exactly. Oakville situation. Exactly. The second thing she did is she proposed a select committee of the legislature, excuse me, a special committee of the legislature to look into it. Mr. Speaker, that party said no because they wanted to have a witch hunt over a former member of the legislature. She produced 56,000 pages of documents and offered to have a wide search throughout government for more documents, and that party and the NDP party voted against it, Mr. Speaker. She appeared in front of committee when asked and answered all the questions, and we saw the Leader of the Opposition had to practically be dragged there, invited over and over again, and refused to answer any questions 28 times, Mr. Speaker. We asked him simple questions, so he would not come forward with any answers, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to to transparency this side of the House. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. To the Premier. Uh, the government is refusing to share basic information with Ontarians about its scheme to tow highways. The Minister of Finance says it will cost, it, uh, the, says tolls will generate 250 to 300 million, while Metrolink says it will generate 25 million. And the Minister of Transportation won't tell us anything. No one in government will say how much it will cost to build the lanes, where the lanes will be, or what the toll will cost, or whether this expensive scheme will actually break even. Why won't your government be open about the basic elements of this risky and co costly tolling scheme? Premier. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I really do believe my friend is asking questions with the best of intentions, but I'd like to direct him to the Metrolink's website, where on that website you can actually see the entire costs. Metrolink's has carefully planned out which routes are optimal. Metrolinx is actually can tell you that the price per kilometer is 47 cents. You can also read today's Toronto Star, which points out that the very successful HOT lanes, Mr. Speaker, across North America are used mostly by people with under $60,000 of that, that uh, $60,000 income. This has been a benefit to middle-income families, especially moms who are trying to get their kids to work. It's a very cost-effective option, and it, it's been a significant impact on reducing congestion, Mr. Speaker. 
sector. This is hardly something used by only affluent people, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and it has not compromised the role of HOV lanes one iota, Mr. Speaker. And that's the fact. Supplementary. The, um, the experience of tolling high occupancy lanes in other places is that the cost of construction and enforcement is high, while the revenues generated are low. In many areas, these lanes have lost money or have struggled to break even. I think the minister knows that. And just last month, we learned that the new hot lanes in Los Angeles had actually increased overall congestion. I also think the minister knows that as well. Why is the government committing to an expensive and risky scheme that is not a serious revenue tool for transit without providing any reason at all to think that it will work? Mr. M Mr. Speaker, we, we have right now, uh, well into construction, the biggest transportation transit build-out in the history of Ontario. Soon, Mr. Speaker, the boring machines on Eglinton will be pulled out and people all across North and Central Toronto will be able to whisk across the city efficiently in some of the most beautiful LRTs and subways ever. Mr. Speaker, in Durham Region, just, just the other day, Mr. Anderson and I launched the BRT system uh, from Durham, from Oshawa to the Scarborough campus of U of T. For now, people all across the Eastern GTA and Ajax and Pickering can now get their kids to school. Mr. Speaker, Answer. we have two-way, all-day go service every half hour on the Lakeshore Line, ending the bedroom communities and, and ending Thank the you. suburbs being a spoke in Toronto's hub. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. I hope you can get excited. Thank you. Your question, member from the Old Southwestern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Regular mammograms are the best way to detect breast cancer. And yesterday, I heard in the news that a study by Cancer Care Ontario researchers found that one type of digital mammography, called uh, digital computed radiography, is less effective than other types of mammograms. As a woman, I'm concerned about these findings. And women across Ontario should be able to rely on the most effective technology to detect breast cancer. Mr. Speaker, could the minister tell us how the situation is being addressed? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I would like to thank the member from York Southwestern yeah. uh, for this question. Breast cancer is a disease that affects too many of us, too many of our mothers, our sisters, <coughs> our daughters, and our friends. Speaker, those women deserve nothing but the best possible care. The decisions we make in healthcare are guided by the best available evidence. Speaker, scientific evidence is always emerging that uh, that guides our decisions about what we need to do to improve our medical practices. So there is new evidence. Speaker, uh, recommendations by our can uh, cancer experts. So we are updating the technology we are we use for breast cancer screening. We're investing $25 million to replace computed radiography devices with direct radiography devices across the province. This will ensure that women will continue to get the most effective screening for breast cancer using the best technology available. I want to Answer. say thank you to the researcher, Dr. Anna Shirelli at Cancer Care Ontario, who conducted this groundbreaking st study. Speaker, it will help thank us you. provide better care for women. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This issue needs to be taken seriously and addressed with strong action, as uh, the minister is doing. Uh, breast cancer is a deadly disease, and early detection is key. If a woman learns she has breast cancer, she needs to be reassured that the health care system will be there with her in her fight against cancer every step of the way. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, can women across Ontario who suffer from breast cancer be sure that they will get the best quality care? Good question. Good question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, I share the, uh, the member's commitment to ensuring that women with breast cancer are given the support they need yeah. to beat this disease. Ontario is a leader in, in cancer care. Speaker, 88% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer in Ontario are alive and well five years later. 
and an Ontarian who gets cancer has one of the best chances of survival anywhere in the world, according to the Cancer System Quality Index. Speaker, this is a result of our government's commitment to cancer care. We've tripled funding for cancer-fighting drugs under the new, funding, uh, new drug funding program, and we're funding 49 additional drugs for Answer. 74 indications. We've cut wait times for cancer surgery. And, Speaker, last year, 97 per cent of Ontario's cancer patients started radiation within the four-week national Thank you. target. Speaker. Good question. The member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This afternoon, the House will debate and vote upon our Opposition Day motion, which, if passed and if the government respects the will of the House, would require the government House Leader to call our non-confidence motion for debate and a vote on May the 28th. An affirmative vote by the House today should compel the government to abide by hundreds of years of parliamentary tradition and explicitly and directly test the confidence that this House has in the government. If our motion passes this afternoon, can the Premier commit to respecting the will of this House? Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I uh, have a couple of points. The first is I, I want to confirm to the member, as I did to his colleague, that this uh, legislature will be uh, dealing with a confidence motion yeah. in the next several weeks when we uh, uh, deal with the budget motion. And Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, God willing, we'll also be dealing with the budget bill at various stages, and that too will be a confidence motion. So we should not be worried. There will be plenty of uh, confidence motions. In terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, process that we have here in the legislature, I thought the member should be very, very aware that Section 44 of the Standing Orders outlines a process by which uh, the motion that he's referring to can be brought forward. And, Mr. Speaker, that's not based on hundreds of years of uh, parliamentary tradition. That's actually a change to the Standing Orders that was brought in by the Progressive Conservatives oh, sure. when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The government cannot evade responsibility on this. Either they respect the will of the House or they don't. There can be no weasel words. There is no middle ground. This is the Parliament of Ontario. Thirteen days have passed since the budget speech, and we're still waiting for the NDP to make up their minds. They may very well sit on their hands again and allow the budget to pass, as they did last year. But a budget motion is a confidence motion only as it pertains to the budgetary policy of the government, not confidence in an overall comprehensive sense. If our motion passes today, the government cannot ignore the will of the House and still claim legitimacy to govern if the confidence question is still outstanding. Will the Premier do the right thing if our motion passes this afternoon and call our non-confidence motion question. for debate and a vote on May the 28th? Thank you. Uh, please. Seated, please. Thank you. Government House Leader. Speaker, I'm kind of enjoying this debate over parliamentary procedure here. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, a government that can't pass its budget cannot govern, so therefore it is naturally a confidence motion. And again, I assure the Mr. member Jeff that we will have a vote on that motion within the prescribed period that's uh, outlined in the standing orders. And as I say, Mr. Speaker, if everything goes the right way, we hope to have subsequent votes on the legislation that accompanies it. In terms of the want of confidence issue that he's put forward, again, I I, I encourage the member to look at Section 44 of the Standing Orders, which outlines the process by which it could be brought forward to the Legislature. And as I say, Mr. Speaker, they are not our rules. They are rules that were brought forward by the Progressive Conservatives when they were in power. Thank you. New question? The, new, the member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It is absolutely clear that this government's OLG privatizing privatization plan is in chaos. Ontarians want to know, is Toronto getting a special deal to host a downtown casino or isn't it? This government doesn't seem to know. Ontarians want to know, are OLG casinos going to be turned over to global gambling operators? This government doesn't seem to know. Will this government admit that its OLG privatization strategy is a total mess and scrap this misguided plan once and for all? Minister of Finance. 
Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. The member uh, opposite has reaffirmed the need to transform the way we do uh, business with the OLG, recognizing the tremendous amount of contributions it brings to produce and initiate more schools, more hospitals, enable us to afford social programs. <clears throat> we need to ensure that the operation of the OLG is managed in an appropriate fashion to maximize the value to taxpayers. That's exactly what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Back this time to the minister, I guess. The OLG and its own hand-picked government's own hand-picked CEO invited global gambling operators to bid on a downtown Toronto casino and floated the idea of a sweetheart deal on the hosting formula to city council to cement that, that deal. These companies in turn made it clear that if they weren't going to get a downtown site and own the operation, they weren't coming to Ontario. The question, with a crucial vote coming up at Toronto City Council next week, will the government finally come clean on its plans for a, uh, for a downtown Toronto casino and let the people and the council know in advance? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, the Council had before them uh, an opportunity to make a decision. They recognize, and it's up to the Council, it's up to the municipality to make that decision. The province has made it clear that we won't provide any special deals to any specific municipality. We're going to be equal, we're going to be fair, we're going to be, it's going to be the same formula across the province. The Council has before them an option and a determination if they want a proponent to bring in billions of dollars in new construction to the City of Toronto. That'll be up to them. In terms of the formula, it'll be determined, it'll be the same, it'll be equal for the entire province. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, a member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, in this age of technology, electronic tools create efficiencies and contribute to economic growth. Over the past few years, Peel Realtors and the directors of Mississauga and Brampton Real Estate Boards requested that the government use the electronic tools for their business transactions. Right. As part of 2013 budget, our government has proposed an amendment to the Electronic Commerce Act, extending the act to land right. transactions. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, could the AG elaborate on the proposed amendment and how it would benefit Ontario businesses? Good idea. Thank you, Attorney General. Well, th uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the, the hardworking member for Mississauga and Brampton South for the question. She has really been a hardworking member here, Speaker. Speaker, I can tell you the government supports the use of electronic communications as broadly as possible for the reasons of both efficiency and economy. And that's why we've introduced the legislation as part of the 2013 budget bill. And I know the member of Prince Edward Hastings is interested in it as well, and he will vote for the budget bill. I'm absolutely convinced. We want to extend that to the Electronic Commerce Act to land transactions as well. We believe that these land transactions would, if the legislation is passed, benefit from the standards and rules for electronic communications that have worked so well over the last uh, dozen years or so in so many other areas. It will benefit businesses as well as consumers in Ontario, and in particular those involved in the real estate industry. Yes, and that's because we know that the real estate industry in Ontario has been requesting this change for some time, and it's time to do it by passing Thank the you. budget, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Attorney General for elaborating on the proposed amendment. It's a good news, not only for Ontario realtors, but also for the consumers. This amendment will allow use of the electronic tools to conduct business efficiently and conveniently. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Attorney General, are there any other ways in which this government is helping our real estate sector in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Attorney General. I know the Minister of Consumer Services looks forward to answering That's this part of the Minister question. Minister of Consumer Speaker. Services. Speaker, I'm very happy to inform the member that we do, in fact, have legislation in front of the House right now that aims to do just what she's asking. Just like the budget we've tabled, there is a, a another bill called Bill 55 to help people in their everyday lives. And it's called our Stronger Protection for Ontario Consumers Act, Speaker. 
And Bill 55 proposes to make changes to the real estate sector to promote a more fair and transparent marketplace. Under this proposed bill, we will make it easier for buyers and professionals to verify the actual number of written offers were made in a competitive real estate bidding process, as well as allow real estate professionals greater options and flexibility in delivering the services they offer. Answer. Bill 55 and the amendments proposed in the budget relating to electronic si signatures that the Attorney General referred to are the type of legislation that helps Ontarians. Thank you. I strongly encourage all members of the part of the legislature to support both. Thank you. New question, the member from Halton. My uh, question is to the Premier. In just a few days, Ontarians will get together with friends and family and fire up the barbecue and open up the cottage on Victoria Day long weekend. As well, many tourists will be travelling to Ontario to visit over 1,500 special events across the province and enjoy the best that this province has to offer. This includes Ontario's wonderful wine, beer and spirits. Mm -hmm. However, a dark cloud looms, threatening to put a damper on all this an impending LCBO strike. The union has engaged in an aggressive ad campaign demanding more, of their more for their workers. Premier, with LCBO stores all carrying Ontario beer, wine and spirits, how in good conscience could this government let an impending strike occur imperiling Ontario's tourism and be beverage industry on one of Ontario's favourite holidays? So, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where the LCBO and, and the employees are negotiating a collective agreement, and it's appropriate and prudent for them to uh, initiate and have those discussions. And uh, we'll allow them to proceed, and I'm hopeful that in the end uh, they'll come to an agreement and that we're all going to be able to enjoy a great long weekend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Premier, given you and your government's record of buying public sector uh, union support with massive wage increases and perks, and perks at the expense of Ontario's fiscal future, is it no wonder we are yet again held hostage in the 11th hour by a union demanding more? This is something you've brought upon yourself, Premier. Public sector compensation is out of control, and Ontario's broken arbitration system is putting Ontario taxpayers at further risk. Right. While your government's budgets have earned us nothing but credit downgrades, our PC plan for sustainable public sector compensation is clearly the only way forward. Will the Premier side with Ontarians for their Victoria Day weekend and their future by preventing a strike, freezing public sector compensation by legislation for a two-year period? Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I, I thank the member for the question. I think the member opposite know, very well knows how our labour relations system works in this province. It is the responsibility, Speaker, of the employer and the trade union to be able to come together to negotiate a settlement agreement. Speaker, we also know that the best agreements are the ones which are negotiated, that are bargained at the, at the, uh, on the table, and we encourage, we encourage both parties. This is not helpful. Both sides, including the third party. Answer, please. Uh, Speaker, I, uh, we encourage both parties uh, to continue to work hard. I know they are, they are negotiating. The government is focused on assisting the parties in reaching a settlement. I'm, I'm very happy to report, Speaker, that uh, our highly skilled mediators from the Ministry of Labour They're have there. met the parties on 19 different occasions Answer. to help them uh, come to a settlement, and I'm hopeful and confident uh, that a settlement will be reached between the LCBO yeah, yeah. And, and the union. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. A member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker, to the Premier. Northwestern Ontario is struggling economically. For years, we've been looking to this government to support job growth and economic development. One project that could have a major impact, resulting in the investment of $700 million and 500 permanent full-time jobs, is the Rainy River Gold Project. But far from supporting this investment, this government is needlessly delaying it by almost two months, uh, by being almost two months late with approving the terms of reference. Why is this government not doing everything in its power to promote job growth in northwestern Ontario? Premier. <laughs> Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, we are very proud of the uh, great record we have in terms of the, the Northern Ontario Growth Plan, let alone the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, where we have provided over the last 10 years 
$824 million in investments, creating, creating or retaining 22,000 jobs in Northern Ontario. Uh, and I can tell you, we're obviously very excited about the opportunities returning to the forestry sector as we see a transforming of that sector, looking to the opportunities in the mining sector. Uh, the, uh, the, not just simply the Ring of Fire, as exciting as that is, but also the other developments as well, working closely with all the industry to make that happen. But certainly, this continues to be a priority for us. We were pleased to be at Phnom last week, the Federal Region of Northern Ontario Municipalities, to speak about how keen we are to continue to move forward with our uh, economic vision for Northern Ontario and delighted to look forward to your supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. This is about the Rainy River Gold Project. This company has done everything right. It has engaged with First Nations and communities from the start. This delay in approving the terms of reference is in part ministry incompetence and partly the result of this Liberal government's cuts to the Ministry of the Environment, a ministry whose budget has fallen by 45 per cent in real terms since the 1990s and, according to the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, lacks the basic resources to do its job. If this government is serious about job growth and job creation, it needs to ensure that the government resources are in place to foster that growth. This is not happening, and this company needs its terms of reference approved by May 17. When will the minister finally sign off so that these badly needed and wanted jobs can move ahead? Minister of the Environment. Speaker, the member may wish to consult with her environmental critic and perhaps with the member for Danforth, the member for Davenport, on the importance, on the importance of uh, giving a full assessment of all the environmental implications of any of these developments. I know uh, the member is eager to see it moving forward, but her party surely would want to make sure that all of the environmental considerations have been given. I have given this personally very high attention as well. And uh, I'm one who is always optimistic, I must say, but I do think it's important for the New Democratic Party to, as it once did, be very concerned about the environmental implications of any development that happens to take place anywhere Answer. in this province. So we will have that opportunity to ask the question. get full evaluation of it and uh, in appropriate time, I'm Thank sure you. that the necessary approvals. Member from Timmins James Bay, come to order. Thank you. New question, the member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> from knows what I'm going to say. In her capacity as the Minister of Agriculture and Food, wow. Speaker, the agri-food industry is one of the largest industries in Ontario. Not only does it employ over 700,000 people, but it provides 34 billion dollars to our GDP. The agri-food industry is composed in a large part of farmers, the men and women who till the fields, plant the crops, and feed Ontarians. Another component important to the agri-food industry and should be recognized on this is the food processing sector. The success of the productivity of food processing is vital. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what our recent budget will do to increase the productivity in the food processing industry. Thank you, Minister of Agriculture and Food. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Ajax Pickering for the question. And he accurately portrays, Mr. Speaker, the importance of the food processing industry to Ontario. And I, I think it's not well understood generally, Mr. Speaker, that this is a $34 billion industry. The, the member from uh, Stormont, come to order. Industry. It's a major economic driver, creating jobs, improving the economy, and supporting our uh, producers. And we believe it's important to support and to contribute to our food processing industry, which is why, Mr. Speaker, the 2013 budget, which we would love to see passed, uh, we included the proposal to extend the capital cost allowance for manufacturing and for processing machinery and equipment. Mr. Speaker, this will have a direct impact on the food processing industry, and this measure will reduce the Ontario tax on manufacturing and processing equipment by $265 million, Mr. Speaker, over the course of the next two fiscal years, and that will support our effort to increase. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Premier. The men and women who work in the food processing sector will be happy to hear that this continues to support everyone in the agri-food industry. In my riding of Ajax Pickering, there will be a number of food processors that can benefit from the extension of the capital cost allowance. Mr. Speaker, 
These same food processors have addressed a concern for red tape. While ensuring that food safety and quality is maintained, duplication in the process can stand in the way of the success of these Ontario companies. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister, Premier of Agriculture and Food please update the House on what our government is intending to do to reduce red tape that exists in this industry? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I have heard this concern from producers and processors when it comes to unnecessary uh, red tape or regulation, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly why the Open for Business Roundtable was created. The roundtable asks for input from producers and processors on how we can work together to find more ways to clear the path for, uh, for business success. The roundtable actually met last week, Mr. Speaker, uh, to discuss the priorities of the sector, both processors and producers were at the table, and uh, there were a number of other ministries, which is important for other ministries to hear the concerns of the, uh, the agri-food uh, business, Mr. Speaker. It was a productive conversation. I was very pleased to be part of that conversation, and it's important that we continue to work together because that's where the solutions are found. When we check in with each other, we find out what's actually Answer. happening on the ground so that we can foster the innovation and productivity that's needed in the sector. Thank you. New question. The member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Minister, I want to tell you about a young girl in my riding named Hope Hawkins, who is hearing impaired. Hope will be entering grade eight next year, which is a crucial year of development for as one transitions into high school. Unfortunately, she'll be the only grade eight student in her class at Robert School for the Deaf in London due to a declining enrollment. Hope has recently been accepted to the Ernest Jury School of Deaf in Milton. She wants to attend the school for grade 8 before entering high school, but she has been denied transportation services because she lives three minutes outside the ministry's 70-minute threshold. It has already been agreed that Hope will receive transportation when she starts grade 9. A public school is not a good option for Hope. EAs and support workers must be hired, special equipment must be provided, and it's an environment full of stigma. Hope has attempted this route three times before, and the educational experience she received has not been ideal. Minister, could you direct the provincial Question. superintendent to approve Hope's request to receive the transportation services in the upcoming year? Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And uh, obviously, I'm not familiar with this uh, particular issue, and uh, we, we, it always is difficult when uh, a, a student needs to be transported to one of the provincial schools and trying to make those arrangements. Um, I think that perhaps in this in instance, it would be best if we could get some more uh, information about the particular case, and then we'll endeavour to see if we can find a resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. We'll receive more information. She's hit so many roadblocks on trying just to get to a school where she can be with her peers. Yeah, yes. Minister, I've met with many constituents who deal with the black and white nature of some of this government's rules and regulations. We need to understand the needs for rules and guide, guidelines, but the inflexibility in a situation yeah. bespeaks to a failure of delivery of essential services. Yeah. This situation takes nothing more than a little common sense, and I hope to get it resolved. I hope that we cannot be beholden to the bureaucratic rules and do the right thing in this situation. Can you let me know soon whether Hope will receive the transportation services to attend yeah. school? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And uh, if we could, um, if we could get the information fairly quickly and get some contact information for the individual student, uh, because we obviously will need to talk to the uh, to the individual families involved to get the accurate information, then I will certainly be very happy to have my ministry look at the situation very quickly. Thank you. The member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. It would seem it's almost a regular occurrence now that we have to ask you questions or we have to have meetings with you to talk about the failure of the privatized system of maintaining our highways across Ontario. Last week, it was the city of Timmins, an area that lost uh, access to highways because of a snowfall that is quite normal for the month of May. No snow plows to be, uh, to be dispatched. And now we had a three-day closure of Highway 101 as a result of MTO not doing what it has to do to inform the contractor and what they have to do to be able to open up a ditch. And as a result, Highway 101 by the, city of Wa the town of Wawa was closed down for a number of days. 
When will you admit the system doesn't work and do something about fixing it before we get in real serious trouble in Northern Ontario? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The member is quite right. We do meet regularly. I meet with member, members of the opposition who have concerns as well as members on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. And as I said to a question the other day, it was very evident in the discussions I had with Northern mayors that the snow we had hail, rain, and snow in sequences uh, that were quite serious. Uh, I have shared with some of his colleagues the snow and ice reports that have come out. Uh, and the weather updates. We've been very transparent about that. This was one of the most difficult winters we've had, um, and I look forward to continuing to work with the member opposite. Um, we are looking at, and he knows because some of his members have been involved in those discussions, about modifications that Answer. we could make to snow uh, removal in the north that could happen. That obviously couldn't happen in the middle of the last contract season, but I appreciate Thank that you. his comments and the issues he's raised, and I'm hoping that we Thank for you. the start of the. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, the only thing has changed is the way that you maintain these highways. Northern Ontario and the rest of this province have been under this type of weather for years. It's not as if it doesn't snow in the month of May in Northern Ontario, and it's not as if. Uh, it's not as if ditches don't freeze and the ministry doesn't have to unthaw them and make sure that the water runs in order to not shut down highways. The issue is MTO has lost the capacity to be able to respond to what the conditions on our highways are and to keep them open. So I'm asking you a very simple question. Will you commit to actually reviewing this system so that we don't end up in a situation every time it rains or snows somewhere in the province of Ontario? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are now in the period between April 22nd and May, May 22nd. Member from Renfrew, last time. Between April and May 22nd, Mr. Speaker, uh, for many years now, we reduced the uh, snow equipment. This has been going on for decades by 50%. But the issue was raised uh, by the member, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, from Tomiski and Cochrane, and I said I would get back to him so I can address that today as well. Uh, the, uh, that was the reason, because we're in the transitionary period right now, so we're uh, contractors phase out about 50 percent of their equipment. Uh, and we've had exceptional late winter snows, Mr. Speaker, which has caused that. But I, I do want to renew my commitment to the members opposite that we said, and you and I have met several times now, and I've met with other members, that we will review that and put changes in place for next winter, that I've accepted the criticism. Now, please. New question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Education. Today we're joined by eight-year-old Elizabeth Yamoa and her dad, Peter. She's eight years old and attends Sunningdale School in Oakville. Last week, our government introduced a budget that, if passed, is going to help create jobs and build a prosperous and fair Ontario for all. One of the ways we'll do this is by continuing to invest in our world-class education system. We've made tremendous gains in that education system with test scores and graduation rates that continue to rise. But we know that better student achievement will give all young people like Elizabeth the tools they need to succeed in the future labour market. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister please tell this House and the students at Sunningdale School how the proposed budget is going to help improve student achievement? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, uh, Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Oakville and welcome his constituent, Elizabeth, wherever she is, to uh, school here. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey. <laughs> Our government is, I'd like Elizabeth and all the students at Sunnydale School to know that our government is committed to enhancing student achievement, closing the student achievement gap, and supporting those students who may be struggling. We know that learning experiences for children in the summer can help students further develop important literacy and numeracy skills. As you will know from your experience as a principal, uh, what often happens, particularly with students who are struggling, is that they actually go backwards over the summer. So that's why we have introduced uh, specific 
literacy and numeracy ca summer camps, summer learning Answer. programs. So if the budget is passed, Speaker, we will nearly double the funding for the summer low learning programming up to three Thank million. You. And in Thank addition, you. there will be Thank you. Um, I remind them, I remind the minister when I stand, you sit. Point of order for the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Earlier in question period, the minister of the Attorney General, uh, in, in response to a question, uh, was in violation, uh, in my opinion, of Standing Order 23 I and J. He actually stated that he knew how I was going to be voting on the Ontario budget. I'm not exactly sure how the minister. It's not a point of order. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, on a point of order. Just wanted to thank you for recognizing me. I wanted to introduce the mayor of Kapuskasing, president of FANOM, the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities, who's in the visitors' yeah. east gallery here today. Watch the well, I'll stop. Well, I can... Point of order for the member from Timmins, James Bay. There, so I'm glad that somebody picked it up, and I apologize for not having you seen you up there, Al. We'll see you later. <laughs> Al, we're glad you're here. <laughs> we have a deferred vote on the motion of the second reading of Bill 36. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Members, take their seats, please. All members, take your seats, please. Last call. All members, take their seats, please. Thank you. Well, not quite. I think I'm going to send the sergeant at arms after him. And, and I'm standing. Ms. Wynn has moved second reading of Bill 36, an act to enact the Local Food Act 2013. All those in favour will stand and rise at, the, at, at a one at a time and be recognised by the clerk. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Mrs. Garrison. Mrs. Jeffries. Mrs. Jeffries. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Crater. Mr. Crater. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. Broughton. Ms. Broughton. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Genovo. Ms. Genovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Miller Hamilton East County Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East County Creek. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Those opposed uh, will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Agriculture and Food. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Excellent. So ordered. There are no deferred votes. This House stands. I will uh, recognize the point of order. I was, if that Sergeant Arch had stood up, I would have said no. That's the Minister, minister of Community, Safety and Social. And to correct. To, uh, Ask the House to join me in congratulating uh, Premier Christy Clark, who won uh, an outstanding uh, election. 
There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.